this is the, the hardest to recognize, is the fine line between being determined and keeping on going with something and abandoning the ship because you know that that thing won't work in the end or because you know that it's just not for you. At the end of the day, business is all about people. I want this eventually to become the biggest and the baddest training company out there. This is Katya Margolin at Venture Cafe Studio. Today's guest is Pedro de Abreu, a Harvard scholar, published author, columnist, and founder of 14X Innovation Group, a consultancy that helps individuals and organizations build their capabilities for innovating. Thanks for joining us, Pedro. My pleasure, Katya. Thank you for having me today. So, tell us. How did you get the idea for 14X Innovation Group? Right, so I saw a, a real problem and a big gap in the training industry because essentially that's what we do. You have these very expensive training companies coming into different organizations, giving solutions that are not really backed with research or backed with science, right? For example, a team may come in and say that you need small teams in order to foster creativity, for example, which may or may not be true, I don't know, but that's just an example. And if that is so, like, show me your data, right? Show me the evidence that that is the case, as opposed to just being based on anecdotal evidence or what you want it to be true. And I think the industry, unfortunately, is plagued with a lot of that, where these, these companies would be helping in some sort of consulting um, in some sort of consulting um, consulting angle but the the numbers the data is not really there to support all those assumptions that they're making so so that where the idea came from basically it was both on my background with in the, in the brain of behavioral sciences as well with workshops and public speeches and so forth and I wanted to put those two together and offer a solution that was very different. And that's where the value proposition comes in, is that we are using the behavioral sciences, the brain sciences, to help with productivity, ultimately with profitability in the bottom line, right? So how did you then go about validating the idea? Right, so I'm, I guess like everyone else does, there's like a the basic validation step is that, the, I guess there are two steps for validation. When I think about validation in a business context is that first you have to have a good value proposition. You have to have something that is good enough to be validated in the first place. And second, you have to have a certain level in degree of shamelessness. And what I mean by that is, is, is basically your, your sales capabilities, right? How comfortable are you with yourself in going out and spending a lot of time on the phone by contacting people and following up with people and getting inside those those places because it's 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 not the case that you build it and they will come, right? You have this wonderful solution, which is like, oh, that's wonderful. The brain, everyone is interested in the brain. It's really sexy. But it's not the case that, but, but who knows, right? Nobody knows about you. So you have to do that. You have to do the groundwork. So I think step number one, you have something that is memorable, something that is good enough, something that is unique. That's your value proposition. You have that down pack. That's great. That's step number one. Step number two is... What are your sales capabilities, basically? And I love this word, shamelessness, right? It's, 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 your, it's your ability to get in front of people and not be afraid to state what your value proposition is and how you can solve a pressing issue that they have. So that has been the validation so far. If you have something that you know fits the criteria of what people would like to have in some way, but the value is a little higher than what they currently have, so that was sort of like the thought process, mm -hmm. but but stronger. And this is an interesting point too. Like so, so stronger the the value proposition, the less you have to prove yourself, because it's it becomes a little more obvious, you know. Some when some elements, some when some of the right elements are in place, and I say this, and this can be applied to really any business, any any business. It's a great business principle. Is that like the more complicated it sounds, usually the more BS it is, you know. So if it's something simple that you can get. You know, what is it that you do 
and how can this help me? If you can get that down to like a, a like a 10, 15 to 20 second thing, you know, where it's just simple to understand and people get it right away, then you're onto something. It's it's a real it's a real problem solver, so to speak, you know. Mm -hmm. So then you got this idea, you got excited. How did you go about making it happen? So I was finishing graduate school and I had had experience with uh, both the strategy as well as the leadership development consulting before and had had experience with business as well. And that was a time, I mean, that was that was when I got the idea. But it just, again, it, like, it wasn't just one thing. Okay, let's do this like you would do like in a technology startup, right? Like you have this idea and then you assemble a team together and then you, you, you move as fast as you can. It was something that I had the, I had the, the opportunity, I guess, to, and the luxury to not move fast, to just see how the idea developed. And when you talk about specific things, I guess the nitty gritty was basically getting a website, right? Like getting a good market behind you as far as developing good materials. That and having a really strict schedule for when I do stuff for the business, right? If I have, let's say, three days out of the week, three mornings, I'm on sales calls. Then I'm on sales calls. I have to make sure that the night before, like I have my Excel ready with all the leads and all the contacts and everyone whom I want to, whom I want to, with whom I want to get in touch, whom I feel would benefit from this, right? And being really disciplined about when you go about doing it and how you go about doing this too. So I think that has been that has been very important. As opposed to again, you build something and you just expect people to come to you. So it sounds like you wanted to build this consulting business and as the idea was developing, once you came to a place where you had a pretty clear vision on what this business was going to be like, some of the fundamental things you had to do was work on your presentation, right? The way you're presenting right. yourself, the way you're getting yourself okay. out there. You mentioned a website, you mentioned proving yourself, um, you mentioned some sales calls. So was that basically how you got started? I think so. I can say that. I can say that. But but you said something interesting. Is that is that like the product had to be ready, so to speak? A big chunk of it has been developing a great product. And the product, I mean, is it's as short as a 45-minute keynote or as intense as like a seven-day workshop where we spend almost every day together talking about stuff, right, developing stuff, um, doing assessments and, and, uh, and basically running the workshop, um, helping you learn more about yourself so that in turn you can do more with what you have. So, and I've consulted with a lot of people, like professors and like wonderful colleagues and, and, and um PhD students mostly, um, friends who are who are who are in the field, not in the consulting field, but like in, in, in the science field, so to speak, and um, helping get those concepts straight, and making sure too that was important. Is making sure too that I wouldn't, I wouldn't go out of the way and extrapolate on some of these concepts because it's really easy to do so. For example, when you're talking about the concept of brain plasticity, right? Like how plastic and and how able you are to learn new things and to change your ways, for example, the older you get, right? That's like, it's, people have made use of that in, in, in very erroneous ways, in a way that, that because there is a certain level of plasticity, they think that, you know, you can do anything you want, which is, is, but is not really true. There is, there is, there are big limitations to that, right? So I have to be careful. So I'm not just another person who's out there spreading bad science the message has to be motivation of course it has to inspire you to action to something whatever action that is and that's outside of my outside of my sphere of influence but it has to inspire you to do something but then at the same time you, you, you have to be careful so that you don't exaggerate on some of those concepts so when it comes to really actually launching the business getting yourself out there getting clients what was the process like to get started with that and so I was lucky that, that I did similar work before when it comes to keynotes and so forth. So I had, a, I had a good list of clients with whom I had worked, but it had nothing to do with this, right? Um, it was for other things and for other type of work. So through referrals, that was one thing. And that's ultimately what you want. And I, th I think that's ultimately what will happen, you know, for, say a year or two from now is that sales outreach will always be there. 
but ultimately it's always those customers who are happy with you and who recommend you to somebody else, right? And um, because you offered a solution that was a great solution, not just a good solution, but a great solution, so much so that I want to tell my friends about it, right? And I want to brag about this because it really helped me and it helped my team think about themselves in a different way. So how do I find specific, specifically like how do I find client, found clients? It was through, other than referrals, through outreach. And by outreach, I mean also networking, right? Being at events and and developing great relationship with, relationships with people and being very clear about what it is, what is the problem that you're solving? What is it that you're going to be able to help me with exactly? You mentioned proving yourself. And I'm curious to elaborate on that concept. For example, were, what came first, this consultancy or some of your writing and your mm. keynote speaking? Did you develop yourself as a thought leader in a space first before starting a consultancy or was it the other way around? That's such a great question. I hadn't thought about it. Yes, I think, I think, I think before I started this, I, I, I sort of positioned myself as a thought leader in the in the field in a way, especially when it comes to producing content. Because I think at the end of the day, if you're in this field, you're also in the intellectual production field. And that's what, one of the things that separates you from other people is that you're constantly producing stuff, whether it's a booklet or a book or blog entries or webinars or whatever it is, like you're, you're giving material out to people so that, and that facilitates, and going back to that question of how, how, how do you go about doing your outreach, is that that facilitates of people getting to know who you are, right? Because I'm not, it's, it's low commitment. I'm not giving you any of my resources other than my time at this point, and I just want to see what you have, if it's really useful, and if it's really, if, and if it's really valuable or not. So I think, I think the writing definitely has to be there beforehand. And all those elements, I can't say they have to be in place before you start it, but it's good that they are because it helps. It helps when you're calling somebody and you say, hey, I work at a research laboratory, a social psychology research laboratory out of Harvard, right? So that automatically puts you ahead of, I would say, right? and, and, being, and being conservative about this, I'll put you ahead of like 95% of, of the people who are doing this work, right? Because that gives you validation. And that's what they want. If a company is going to hire you, they they either want to hire you because they've seen how good you are or because you have enough validation around you that they know that you have to be good so that people trust you, trust your trust your solution. Yeah. So how did you get started with basically positioning yourself as a thought leader? How did you get started with... Um, being asked to give keynote speeches, right, right, um, right. you had a TEDx talk, you are published in all sorts of publications. Right. How did all that get started? Right, so it doesn't have a lot to do with this current work, but at the same time it does because it led to it. But so how I started, at least in the in the in the public speaking sphere, right? Like um, it was well, I'll take you back in time, and I'll be I'll, be, I'll, I'll summarize this. So. Back in the day, um, I went to community college first before I went to four-year school um, in, in South Carolina. And I happened to get an award by the Coca-Cola Foundation in USA Today. And right then, a, another community college called me and they said, Pedro, could you come and share your studying secrets with us? And to me, I didn't have any studying secrets. It's like you, you get down and do the work. But then the more I thought about it, I said, you know, something that may not be a secret to me could be a secret to somebody else who doesn't have perhaps access to those resources. And I said, sure, I would love to do that. But before I did that, I thought about how I can not be boring and not just be another person who comes in and it's like, oh, so-and-so got a big award. Oh, big shot. Let's listen to you. Right? That, that just doesn't, it, it's not good. It, it, it breaks that, it's not sexy enough for me as a listener to sit through a presentation by someone who's just a big shot and there's nothing in it for me. So how can I break that barrier and make it all about them, the people. 
So I started developing. That was like that was like two months before, right? They gave me that invitation. So I started developing sort of like a system and seeing how that would how, how they worked with other people who were established in whatever public speaking sphere, and how would you go about relating that message? And it turned out that it was just like a thirty minute presentation, and you know I told personal anecdotes, personal stories, and then the story and that's what i learned up to this date is that like it's very effective like a story and then the point always as opposed to just be there okay here are the seven steps and listen to me but there is an anecdote preceding that it makes you listen not only makes you listen but it, it gives you it gives you permission to tell the point because you've been through it and because you sort of know what you're talking about and you validate a lot of that through storytelling the same thing for branding right um yeah, and that went really well. And then I, I figured, and I had, I've always had this entrepreneurship bug about me. And in a sense that always try my best to recognize opportunities, whatever it is that I'm doing. I want to be able to see, I'm not done that I want to be able to see, but I want to be able to recognize what it is that I can't do with the things that I have currently. So I said, okay, this could be a platform for something special here, right? And so... I got another call and then I said, this is fun. And then I started making the phone calls myself and I said, hey, this is what I can do for students, right? This is the word that I got. So again, this is a very important concept. This is, it's leveraging. You always want to leverage what you have. You always, as you build that mountain, and I think a lot of people make this mistake is that as you build that mountain, you want to stand on top of that little mountain so that you can get more stuff on which you can stand and then you can always going higher and higher, you know, you don't want to have that mountain there. And then you go on naked soil, so to speak, and then you do this work again and then you get some stuff and then you go somewhere elsewhere, right? You always want to build on that, on the platform that you have built. So I was leveraging, right? I leveraged the, the award. So that was a, a, a platform on, on which I stood. And I said, this is the award that I got and this is what I could do for your students, right? I'd love to come to your school. And at the time, I didn't even know that they would give you money for that kind of stuff. And it turns out that they did. And I said, oh, that's pretty cool, you know. And I was like, wow, this is, this is great. <laughs> so, so that's how I started. And, I, and then from there, that work naturally evolved into leadership development. And I noticed that people had a, a lot of interest in my life story and the things that I had been through. And they were really captivated by that. You know, the fact that you're born into these very challenging circumstances in Brazil and you came to America, me, right? And I came to America without knowing how to speak any English at 15. And then three years later, you're in the startup world, right? And then like two years after that, you, you're in the nonprofit world and then you're always doing stuff. So they are curious of how can you help us help develop that in our people? So that's, I, that's how it all started. But it was, all, it, it was a lot of, sh again, that's the theme. There was a lot of shamelessness involved in a sense that when I recognized it, I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this because this is something powerful and I think it could help a lot of people. And so that's what it is. Um, being very shameless about things, about who you are, what you stand for, and really not being afraid. Not being afraid of calling people, right? Calling a college and say, hey, this is, this is the solution. Uh, that I can offer to your students and and so again I made a website <laughs> right and I was doing this work and it's 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 great it's very gratifying so that was the background before right before I got involved in brain behavioral stuff and ended up studying that formally and as well be involved in a, in, in a research lab on that and I think that again it evolved into that thing which is Fortinex Innovation Group today so Awesome. And when did you start 14X Innovation Group? Officially? Mm hmm And just back in August now. Okay. And yeah. we're right now in... Uh, so it was August 2015 and... 2015, right, right, right. So it was August 2015 and, and now we just... Uh, we just entered January 2016. So, okay. Woohoo. Just a few months. So what have been some of the major milestones so far? Major milestones. There have been, there have been many. But... Two of the clients we are currently work with, we're going to start working with them in February, but we, we have them as clients, which are Logitech and Google, both of, which in, both of which in California. So when I think about the concept of milestones of achieving something, I think to date, that has been the biggest thing. 
So what has helped you get there? I think that takes us back a little to the beginning. Um, as far as that notion of positioning, because no matter what kind of connections you may have to, to decision makers, right? to people who have the power to bring you in to an organization, they won't say yes. In most cases, they won't take the time out of their day to be looking at a case or that where you, you, you don't have a very well-defined value proposition, right? You don't have a very well-defined solution. So being very clear about who you are is very important. And also, in this whole process of positioning yourself, being very intentional about what it is that you need in order to become, so to speak, a thought leader in whatever field. So those are two things. The third thing is, at the end of the day, business is all about people. It's all about those personal connections. It's all about who knows you. It's all about who you know and, and, and the people in your, in your overall network. So it's both of those cases came from, from personal connections through people who know people who knew people who got you in touch because they thought that you could you could possibly benefit organization X and organization Y, right? People get stuck in that. They think, you know, how can I get in touch with person X? That's fine. But I think more important than that, if you have a background that carries you through, then that part becomes easy. Because all the validations, all the validation steps are already present. So when that person sees you, they don't just see you as somebody who just wants to go in, but somebody who wants to go in because you can really help. But I think the most important thing is that your competitive advantage is, is the way you think, is the way you present solutions, is what can you do for me that is different from what everyone else could be doing for me. So what is the grand overall vision for Fortune X Innovation Group? I'll, I'll tell you what it is. Um, it's a big vision. I want this eventually to become the biggest and the baddest training company out there. But not just any training company, because what sets us apart is that we are and we will be a team of scientists coming in to those places, delivering those solutions. It's not that we are just people who want to, who, who are offering the solutions without the background. It's really important that like you, you're, you're passionate about, you're passionate about the field, number one, but, but I think even before that is that, is that you have the background so we can just keep continuing differentiating ourselves, you know, that's one of the competitive advantages and that's one of the differentials, so to speak, biggest and better training company. When it comes to, as far as now, when it comes to productivity, basic productivity stuff that you and I can do in the workplace. And at the end of the day, even going off a tangent, perhaps digressing a little, but at the end of the day, things that, very simple things that, that you and I can do, right? And at the end of the day, I think it's, it's really all about empowerment, but empowerment through the right methods, not empowerment through anecdotal evidence through be happy because I said you should be happy but it's because be happy because this is what the data says you should do and this not only that but this is what the data says you 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 some of the steps that you could be doing in order to achieve whatever outcome it is that you want to achieve it's all about taking helping people get from point a to point b and how do you present that information to them so that they do listen to you so that's the overall vision Awesome. Don't have a date for that yet. One that will happen. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. So what are some big mistakes you've made? I think I have to say, first of all, that I have made a ton of mistakes. Big mistakes, small mistakes. And like when you feel the urge of talking to someone, for example, but you don't talk to that person. I think that's a big mistake. Some of the biggest opportunities that I have come across have come through intuition, a nurse that I had, okay, I need to talk to that person. I don't know why, but I should. Even if it's like a weird thing, like I'm in the subway or like I'm, I'm, I'm like a, at, at this networking event or whatever it is, like I feel the urge of talking to that specific person. 
And so many great things have come because of that. And I cannot say that it's because, oh, it's a great intuition that you have and something in you just knew. Maybe nothing in me knew. But it was just that urge. Say, just go talk to that person, right? Maybe that person just looks interesting enough that there would something there is going on, right? And some of my biggest, biggest things, um, opportunities happen because like very unexpected connections, unexpected, um, unexpected events. I'll give you an example, but I, I can't be too specific, and I, I wouldn't say this person's name. But I was at the at the at the Harvard Faculty Club for a class meeting this is back in the day and as we were leaving i went to the restroom and then i came out by myself and i saw this gentleman sitting on a table by himself full of stuff on the table and he had this name tag and it said like uh, the harvard coaching institute or harvard institute of coaches yeah the harvard coaching institute and right away it caught my eye, right? I could have just walked by and said, okay, this is cool, let me look it up later. But I, instead, I stopped right away. I said, hey, excuse me, and I'm sorry to bother you, but I I like your name tag. And that's exactly what I told him. And he said, well, great, so tell me about you. And then we started the conversation. And it turns out that he's one of the founding members of the Coaching Institute. And it turns out that I got an invitation to join. And it turns out that all these wonderful things happen because you're in that space, so to speak. So that would have been a mistake, you know, had I just not listened to that small voice, so perhaps to that impulse, right? But to just not be... be proactive. It seems like the lesson here is be proactive, be open, um, put yourself out there, and be curious in others, right? And talk to them, perfect. right? Yeah. Perfect. Great lessons learned. You summarized it better than I ever could. That's perfect. Yeah. That's a small mistake, right? Big mistakes real quickly. So like, for example, the first startup I was involved with when I was right out of high school, it's um, not knowing when to, this is the, oh gosh, this is the hardest part. And this is like, that was, I can't say it's the biggest mistake I made, but it's, it's, this is the, the hardest to recognize is the fine line between being determined and keeping on going with something and abandoning the ship because you know that that thing won't work in the end or because you know that it's just not for you. And it's so hard because it goes deep into psychology now, right? This notion of sunk costs in economics and social psychology is that like you have invested so much and it's such a beautiful term, it's sunk costs. Like it's, in the, it, it's, it's, it's in the depth of ocean now, in the depths of the oceans, right? It's just there, but it's yours. You have an attachment to that sunk whatever down there, and that makes you anchor to that, that anchors you to that spot mentally, and you just don't want to leave. And that explains a lot about life, other things too, but so knowing exactly when something is actually a sunk cost or just a, or just sweat equity, for example, that's really hard and that's something that I'm sure I will struggle with for the rest of my life and I'm sure everybody struggles with this but being able to just recognize when is it that you should leave something and when is it that you should keep going because right. it, it's a hard distinction, really hard distinction between the two. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any things that have helped you make that distinction? Help me make that distinction today. I think there's one is that having been through been through a situation like that and recognizing that that was such situation I think helps a lot because when you encounter it again you're able to say I I've seen this before mm -hmm. anything uh, specific that might you know be some pointers for people or are there any specific indicators that let you know you know what this is a situation where it's not quitting it's just recognizing when something isn't working right. and moving on I can say one thing not very scientific at all. But if your heart is no longer in it, that's a good indicator. If you feel in your gut that it's just not right, that's usually a good indicator. But again, that's very different from, for example, me telling you that I'm starting this web company, say, and things are just not working out. I can't get any customers and I'm quitting. That I don't accept ever at all right your processes are wrong your sales is wrong your team is wrong something right so to that there is a solution 
But the other side of it is like your your heart absolutely is not in this. And you really don't believe this. Not because you're fearful of whatever, but just because you, it's, it's just not there. Um, I think that's an indicator. But that's, that's not hard science, right? That's not a, an objective answer that I can give to that. Mm-hmm. Sure. It's mostly experience. Um, and it's that notion of Daniel Kahneman from a few years ago. It's a, I mean, from, since the 80s, actually. But a few years ago when he published his, his book. Think, what, what was the name again? It's a Think Fast, Think Slow. Um, of the author? Uh, Daniel Kahn- Kahneman. Um, he's, a, he's, an, he's, he's, a, he's a wonderful professor. Um, he was he was a Nobel laureate in in behavior econo- in economics, and it's uh, one of the premises of the book and one of the premises of of the re- of of his research is this notion of intuition and how intuition is based on on experience and how we are able to recognize some of those situations on the spot because we've seen it before and not necessarily because we have just this great wonderful thing that we are born with and we say hey this is what it is but it's actually because you have seen it so experience helps a lot in making those distinctions but here's what you don't want ever is looking back and knowing not just thinking but knowing that you could have done other things to change that situation whatever situation it is and regretting not having done it that's what you don't want so you avoid that. You avoid it by working your ass off. You avoid it by not giving in to pressure. You avoid it by conquering your fears. And that's touchy-feely stuff that we don't talk about, but that's real important because everyone has that. Everyone goes through that, right? Before those big important decisions, before those big interviews, and before those important phone calls, and before those big presentations, and before whatever, there is, we are conditioned to be fearful before those situations. They are unexpected situations. Mastering that 